Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back, and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. You're listening to the Jay Bird Watching Podcast, the official podcast of JaysJournal.com and Fansided.com, where we discuss all things Toronto Blue Jays baseball. We'll talk about news, rumors, and game recaps. So whether you're a diehard fan or just getting started with the team, this is the podcast for you. Here is your host, Craig Borden, with co-host Jason Lyons and me, Ken Alfred. You're listening to the Jay Bird Watching Podcast. Yeah, right out of the gate. <laughs> <laughs> Ken's got me all fired up with that new intro. <laughs> <laughs> so I, as properly introduced by uh, our bu- my buddy Ken here, I am Craig Borden, your host. I am here with Jason Lyons and Ken Alfred. Fellas, how are we doing this evening? Good, good, good. Doing all right. Wish my internet was working so I can be on video. <laughs> <laughs> Those damn technical resources, you know, and, you know, I, I, I promote you to producer of the show. <laughs> <laughs> of course it happens crush, this way. Crush yeah. Crush the intro. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, it made, I don't know if you, but before we get into our thing, Jason, do you recall, like, uh, in, in your area of Canada, did they have, uh, did they have the Rogers outage for you as well? Oh, yeah. It was, I mean, it was monstrous. It was huge. Like, yeah. um, I know people, um, who own, you know, fairly significant businesses, shout out to Bomber Brewery up there. Um, their whole business was basically shut down. If you own a brewery and you're, you know, you, you're having people come into the, to the tasting room and everything, everything you're doing is running off some sort of a, a, a Wi-Fi feed. And when it went down, it crushed huge parts of, of the city of Vancouver. They still haven't made back the dollars that were lost because it wasn't just one day for lots it was multiple days because yeah. whole server banks went down it was it was insane yeah and, and i don't think it really hit you craig but yeah when rogers went down so there's in canada there's two major ones which is rogers and bell and all that sort of fun stuff and for some reason everyone was i had all my stuff bundled together so my home phone my internet and my even my work phone were all rogers so they all went down and uh, I couldn't tether off of anything. So I said, okay, it's a day off. And uh, the, what concerns me the most is that it affected 911. And I thought that was like the only thing that has to be on a dedicated network, that that cannot go down. And it affected, like you said, I think, like Dee was talking about, it's like you couldn't even use, like some places you couldn't use Visa or you can use credit, credit cards or debit cards. So, you know, someone, one of my friends was in a lineup for like at Tim Hortons for I think almost an hour because they were hungry. And they couldn't tell him that, oh, yeah, we only do cash only here. And it was like, we were, you could have just told people that so we wouldn't be waiting for an hour. But anyways, hopefully we'll get past this and hopefully for next week I'll be all right. But uh, <laughs> back to Craig, what are, we gonna, what are we talking about today? So we are going to talk Blue Jays news because funny enough, in the midst of a Major League Baseball playoffs that we are unfortunately no longer a part of, the Toronto Blue Jays did make their first splash of the offseason. I do think that many Toronto Blue Jays fans saw this coming. It wasn't a complete shock, but there's a reason I'm wearing my New Hampshire Fisher Cats championship year uh, Eastern League champs <laughs> hat right now. And that's because John Schneider is going to get three more years, maybe a fourth, you know. We're going to see what happens, but the it was a mutual option, I believe, for the fourth season. But Threat to that point, I think the Blue Jays got their man. At least that seems to be what their thoughts were. Um, Jason, I'm going to let you keep, keep kick this one off. It's a three-year deal. He's been in the organization for like 20-something years because he was actually drafted by the Toronto Blue Jays, worked his all his, you know, all his way to the actual major leagues, and then gets this job. Yeah, I mean... 
Well, it's, it's, I, I, you know, I've looked at this a, a number of different ways, not only with John Schneider, but I, I feel like there's a lot of this going around in professional sports right now, where we see some guys that were real superstars making the, you know, trying to make the jump into coaching and then that not working out very well. And then you see guys who are journeymen, guys who've been in organizations or in a sport for 30, 40 years, they're putting in their time, they're, they're, you know, they're grinding, grinding, grinding. So I mean, for me, I think it's an excellent deal for the Jays. I feel like because Schneider grew up with these these young kids that the Jays have in the system right now, um, they they regard him as almost a father figure. And uh, you know, I think that that when we were talking about you know a couple of weeks ago, the Jays possibly needing just like that one veteran presence to sort of push them over the hump. I almost feel like Schneider having them for a whole full Major League Baseball season next year will be able to change the whole thing because, you know, we started with, with uh, Charlie Montoya and I don't think Schneider had his foot, his footprint on the team at that point. I mean, he still was associated, you know, still associated with the, them growing up with, with Vladdy and with, with, with Bo and, and, and with Biggio. But I think this is going to be the first year where he can really lean into it and, and really sort of see what he can make out of this team. And I'm very interested to see, you know, what does come of it because, I think he's a good guy. I, I I love the way that he he speaks sort of freely, and he's just sort of like, yeah, man, like that's rad. Like you know, like he's just he's he's out there. He's he's not your normal atypical guy, and um, I really like him. He literally enjoys the shit out of it yeah. <laughs> for his yeah. speech. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's it's amazing to me. You know, like it'd be like if uh, you know, like if any of us was named to be the manager of the Jays, you'd be like, oh my god, this is so awesome. Like. At all times, you'd be like something like, you know, am I watching this from this close? Is this happening right in front of me? But he's got the, you know, he's got the 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 chops to back it up. Um, and I hope that he can sort of, um, I found him to be a little, you know, I, I'm in Vancouver. And one of the things we're looking at right now is how terrible the Canucks are. And, and we're looking at how soft Bruce, Bruce Brudeau is as a coach. Um, he's a player's coach. Everybody loves him. Great, great guy. And I just don't want Schneider to fall into that deep hole that's really hard to get out of. Dave Roberts in LA is the perfect example of how you maintain being a good guy, a player's coach, and still being a coach. Um, he's he's one of the best in the whole league at it. Um, and Dusty Baker would also be another one where his players love him. They'll go to the mat for him. They'll bang trash cans for him, all kinds of stuff like that. But, you know, Dusty was a, a decent baseball player that turned into an, an outstanding manager. Ken, you want to pick up the ball there and run with it? What do you think about the Schneider acquisition for three more years? Well, no, I think it's great just because now we have that stability here. I think Schneider will now be able to, I think he only, what, what was his record? It was like 42 and 26 or something when he took over the Jays? Ballpark, yeah. On the ballpark there. Look it up. So I think it allows him to, like you said, have a full season to really maybe play around with the lineup. Because I guess during the time when he started, it was like, whatever was working, we go with it. But now we have like a whole 162 game season where, okay, we'll try. We have a lot, we have a lot more to play with the lineup to see what will work. And uh, hopefully we'll definitely do better than that last year. So very happy about it. The fact that he's a lifelong, almost like a lifer, to be honest, uh, in the Jays organization definitely helps. And uh, now, let me ask this, guys. If you could, if you were the managers of the Blue Jays, what would be the first decision you would make right now? <laughs> cool. Uh, who won? Who wants this one? I'm trying to think of even what I would do. Hot, hot, hot bag of rocks thrown <laughs> at you. I mean, the 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 Jays have a number of things they need to address. Um, I mean, I think that that they've got three or four guys that they need to to either sign or or figure out what they're going to do with them. Um, I feel like a guy like Kevin Vigio, they really need to figure out what they need, what they're going to do True. with him. Um, he's an asset to other teams and he's not an asset to the Jays right now. They have too many Kevin Vigios and he, he's a good expendable asset that they could probably get either good prospects for or a very good playing outfielder or, um, you know, a middle reliever or something like that. But um I think that's where I would maybe set my first marker would be to deal with Kevin Vigio and just make sure that if the Jays are going to keep him, he has some sort of defined plan moving forwards. Yeah. And if they're not, then great. Let's see what we can get for him. You know, he's a good kid. Um, he's probably not. He probably hasn't excelled as much as we had a, we had hoped. 
But I mean, you can always hope you can get sort of what we got for Gritchick and move on. Yeah. <laughs> to that point, I think um, harking on what Jason was just saying, th- that defined role for a few few guys. We've seen what's in flashes what Biggio can do, especially that first year when he's been struggling with health and consistency and all sorts of things. I think knowing those battles that we're going to have coming into spring training for more or less what's going to be the fifth uh, pitching spot, a lot of bullpen pieces. You've got people like Nate Pearson and a couple other young prospects that have kind of fallen off the radar. They're actually probably going to be healthy this coming year. The um, Eric Pardino is still floating around in the Blue Jays Meyer leagues. And this is the, you know, the best Brazilian baseball player ever is what he was hyped up for Blue Jays ever. fans. And we haven't gotten to see him for the last two years. He's had Tommy John. He's finally better, apparently. And he's actually going to play minor league baseball this year. Does he play at AAA with Buffalo and make a push for that bullpen thing to start the season? I highly doubt it, but those are the kind of things that are coming. And knowing Schneider's one of those guys that looks at and evaluates minor league talent because he was himself was a, was minor league talent, both as a pitcher or a catcher and a actual manager. So this is what you want, though, at the end of the day, bringing your guys up through the minor league system and getting them to where you need to go. And if they're not going to make that splash on the free agent market, which I don't know if they're going to do, I think that this is eventually a trade situation for the Blue Jays, mostly this off season, but working with what you have. And I think the aggressiveness that we saw as soon as Schneider took over this team is just to where they're going to have to go, continue molding what this team really is. And I think they're going to take on more of his personality this season. And let's not split hairs. There's a couple of massive chips that are going to be out in the ether right when when things go to start to go to free Correct. agency. And I mean, those things are going to also dictate, you know, if Shohei ends up somewhere in the, in the East, like, I mean, you have to do something <laughs> to battle against that. You know, if Judge goes to L.A. or wherever he's going to go, again, that's a massive chunk <laughs> out of... Uh, out of the, uh, you know, out of the Yankees lineup that if he stays in the East and, and moves to another team, again, you have to start. And, and I've seen, I feel like the Houston Astros do this as well at it. And the LA Dodgers do it really well too. They have their team designed to play against and beat teams. Yeah. So they have a lineup that will beat the Giants. They have a lineup that will beat the Mariners, even though they don't play them. They know what their strengths are. They know how to go about it. And again, this goes back to Dave Roberts and and the whole Dodger organization being phenomenally ahead of the baseball trend. But the Astros are prepared for any situation. And you can see it. They don't panic. They know exactly. They they appear to know exactly what's coming. Now, again, we could talk about trash can. But I feel like the Jays need to get a little bit more situational where you know, like I saw games where Vladdy was DHing, and I didn't think he should be. He was, you know, he hit well against this guy. And again, he's decent on the defense. Maybe put somebody else in the DH and throw somebody in the outfield, throw Merrifield or somebody else mm-hmm. in the outfield where they're sitting him and then trying to throw him late in the game. But I mean, you know, I think that's that part of them finding their personality. Ken, you brought the question. What are you thinking for uh, the man? Well, piece? Uh, I think I mentioned the, with the manager piece already, though, right? So I think we talked about uh, that already, like great fit and all that sort of stuff. If oh, I, I meant was the, the, where you were going with that conversation there with the <laughs> things to do, first moves. <laughs> well, aside from bringing back Kelly Gruber. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't think you're going to like that one too much right now. He'll just yell at people. and. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's honestly what you guys are talking about is is uh, really removing the underperformers of the team right now to see what we can get for them, right? Because, you know, like you said, I, I'm, I'm with you about Biggio. I mean, I had so much expectation for him during this season, and for some reason just couldn't perform in, in some way, shape, or form, and, that, and that's really unfortunate because I know there was a big hype around Bichette and Biggio because it's like, oh, they're the sons of the of their dads who were all like, you know, big, big time major leaguers as well. So I'd probably try to clear up some space from that one uh, in terms of what we need. Well, I know what we don't need. We don't need a catcher right now because I think we're full there. Um, so, I, I mean, I try to see what we can get for Bijou. And, and just so, just so I, let me know this here. Is, I was actually looking online and apparently, remember we talked to last week about, uh, you know, show me Otani. 
and all that sort of stuff. Yep. Like uh, that's the name of the episode, of course. <laughs> but there's actually now people on the websites are actually saying that could it happen? Yeah, I think a lot of that was people running with that idea that you know, Blue Jays Twitter and whatnot was the reason we started talking about it last week on our show. Yeah. Come on, let's let's not split hairs. It's only because this show, this <laughs> we were talking about it. That's why everybody's talking about it. Hey, cheers. <laughs> to say, well, you got that from the Jaybird watching. You darn yeah, right, they did. they did. And now we have the intro to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We can show them some Jaybird watching. <laughs> so yeah, maybe next week we'll have the video intro, but that's another thing altogether. <laughs> Good. So does anyone else think it's super weird that uh, Carlos Correa is uh, in the booth and talking about Pena playing shortstop and Pena's having like the like the most epic worlds are, you know, uh, uh, finals and, and he's probably going to crush it in the in the in the World Series. Like it's got to be like an out of body experience, right? <laughs> that could be me. <laughs> it's so bizarre to me. I was watching it the other night and. He's just like, he's so robotic when he talks about it. And they're like, oh, Penny and another home run. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody cares. Like, just <laughs> move on. Let's go. Let's go to something else. Um, yeah. But what do you, what, what, so what are you guys thoughts on, on the actual World Series now that we're coming up on it on Friday? Ooh. Go Phillies. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's fun. It's something that's funny. Like, I did not expect to like, Houston didn't seem like they had any issues getting to this. They were all undefeated, I think, right? Not one loss at all. Seven and zero. Mm-hmm. Seven and zero. No, seven and zero. They're steamrollers and crazy. They beat the Yankees for the third straight time. They had to meet in the playoffs, and I feel bad. For, I mean, I don't feel bad for the Yankees. I'm like, wow, what do you do from the for that perspective? I think it's going to be interesting because right now, as great as Houston is, there's something with Philadelphia, man. Like Harper is crushing it. I don't know how to how to describe it. Like like him and uh, sorry, what's his name? The legend of Reese yes. Hoskins, Schwarber. <laughs> yeah, Hoskins, right? <laughs> and the funny thing is about Hoskins, like he may not be hitting the ball well. I think he's batting only me one eighty two in the playoffs. But out of the eight hits that he's had in the entire playoff series, five of them have been home runs. So there's a sixty three percent chance when he hits the ball, it's potentially going to be you know a home run. So, and it's the same with Kyle Schwarber. Schwarber apparently. And I didn't know this. They they put this stat up the other night that the only player, I believe, that has had more home run to at bat percentage than Kyle Schwarber is Babe Ruth in the playoffs. (laughs) Like Kyle Schwarber hits a home run like from the start of his career when he, you know, was I believe his Cubs. um, He has hit more home runs per at bats than anyone but Babe Ruth in the playoffs, which is bonkers and he hit that one what five and change the other night at oh. exit velo was like 117 yeah. or something he did that Crazy. before that's not the first monster ridiculous home run the year they the cubbies won the world series finally he hit that ball that landed on top of the scoreboard so yeah. and by the way if you want your useless baseball trivia moment for the night they actually got the ball back because it was up on the roof there basically and they, where it hit the ground, they encapsulated it in like a little freaking like canister. So it there with like a little plaque <laughs> that says Kyle Schwarber home run ball and the date and everything with how many feet Kyle Schwarber was here. <laughs> yeah. That's just fun exactly. stuff. And that's what I love about baseball yeah. right there. You know, the, 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 the Cubs, you know, culture was fun enough to do something cool like that to just <laughs> enshrine that baseball because they had it. <laughs> Could have sold it for a million dollars or whatever, you know, probably because you know it was the first World Series the Cubs won in how many years? <laughs> hundred and three. Like There's it it? It over a hundred. I know yeah. that um, it's craziness. But I mean, and n- not being a Cubs fan, but just even when that was happening, I don't know that there was anybody that wasn't cheering for the Cubs. I mean, there was a very Indian small fans. percentage of the population that was not. Well, yeah, I, mean, I figure even some of them were like, yeah, let's just get it done. All right, and, you know, yeah. like it's. Um, but uh, you know, uh, uh, Ken, you were mentioning the, the Astros are seven and zero. Oh. I, I I feel like um, one of the things that they 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 have dealt with so unbelievably well. And again, I I hate to pump their tires, but um, is like I said before, it's preparedness and adversity. Um, they seem to be ready for anything. And um, I mean, if I was a betting man, I would probably be be taking Philly just because of the fact that. Uh, they, you, you know, they're, they're the underdog and they're the wildcats and they're, I've always liked that kind of, you know, long haired galoots that are coming out there and, 
and just grinding out baseball games where the you know not unlike the the Yankees the the uh, the uh, Strohs always appear to be so polished and so clean and so you know like everybody's got their beards trimmed and their hair cut and you know they're almost too perfect eh Jason but I mean they also have you know to that point Altuve hasn't hit a baseball since you know 2012 um, <laughs> and I guess you know the 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 Phillies have Brandon Marsh who again he hasn't what is he 0 for 27 but he did come up with a big clutch home run in the last series against the Yankees too. So Huge. that was the whole, that, that was the end of that game. So to, there's there's it's it's almost like the team that should win versus Magic. And right now those are the two things yes. that are going on, and that's what you're getting. And to your point of them going to be at each other's throats, it's, it's not starting out easy for either team with Justin Berlander versus Aaron Nola. So. Just saying, hitting might come at a premium on Friday evening, but there is some hot hitters in both those lineups. Your Jordan Alvarez doesn't. How about Verlander fit, though? Miss a ball, but yeah, Verlander, ageless wonder. I mean, it, it's yeah. it's he he is completely like he, it's so. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the documentary Fastball. I have. Um, if you haven't, it's excellent. Uh, it was on Netflix. I don't know if it is anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a part in it where Justin Verlander's talking about um, coming out of college and his uh, he had Tommy Johns and his fastball just accelerating and getting faster and faster and faster and faster. And he said just that first time that that he threw a pitch and he knew it was the hardest pitch he'd thrown. And he looked up and it said 99. And then he let the next one go and it said 101. And he was just like, wait a second. <laughs> well, what was that last huh? part? And so, you know, like, I've got to give it to a guy like Verlander being an old man myself. I mean, I, 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 you know, kudos hats off, buddy. He's, he's just out there absolutely crushing it. His teammates love him. And um, if Houston wins, he's the only bright spot for me, except for Pena. I do like Pena a lot. Dusty Baker winning. It would be the icing on the cake for me. Cause you know, Verlander is obviously one, one and Baker being one of baseball's most tenured and coolest guys in the game and i can root for him all day every day and uh he turned 73 on friday on friday yeah. night and wow. then regardless of all the stuff and him writing the ship to the point of where he did after what was a fiasco that i'm still as a baseball enthusiast very butthurt about just saying <laughs> <laughs> yeah that uh, i i there was some integrity level of the game there and there's still just enough people on that team that i'm I don't want to see them win about. You mentioned one of them in Altuve. I don't want to see that man ever win a damn ball game again if I ever have <laughs> had a choice in it. I don't know how any of yeah. them are allowed to even play baseball. But what do I know? <laughs> so and this is related to the scandal you're talking about. Sorry, just so it's correct. Follow, I can keep the up banging. With... <laughs> so to that point, I. As a Blue Jay fan, you would think that maybe I am a little skeptical on that whole thing with, you know, George Springer being our center fielder. I still have even issue. I will I can't I will never say that I'm a George Springer fan. I'm happy he's on our team, but I'm not gonna go out and buy a jersey. <laughs> not gonna go out and stuff. Yeah. But I mean, it, you know, the baseball's had so many different levels of of what people were willing to, you know, like the whole thing with Judge this correct. year and people saying, oh. You know, the Barry Bonds isn't a legit home run. Well, yeah, he did. He, he hit all those home runs. Like, yeah. I don't care how many steroids you it take. Happened. He still had to hit those yeah, home runs. Yeah, you still have to physically and, hit the ball. Correct. Right. And McGuire and Sosa. And to try, have people try and take that away from them, just because Aaron Judge is a shiny toy mm-hmm. out of New York, it's just like, come on, man. Yeah. Like, I do have to mention this. If the steroids helped so much, why was Jerry Jeremy Giambi such shit? <laughs> oh lord <laughs> just saying that might just, as well have had one eye exactly right swinging a boat or it may make me stronger yeah. you may be able to recover faster but you still gotta be able to read a pitch and be able to hit the ball if so, you want to ruin your body for the rest of your life go right ahead that's your choice yeah i said the same for bodybuilding because some people say oh bodybuilders when they take the steroids that oh it's an easy thing i'm like they still have to put in the work Correct. to get there right yeah. so <laughs> it's no any steroid you're yeah Described by a doctor, all that sort of stuff. Is it should everyone be on it then? If that's the case, but I don't know about that. Yeah. But it does kind of like say, yeah, be, as you talked about before, you can't uh, you can't teach. Your steroids cannot help you hit a ball faster or far. Or, no, they right. can't do it. No, no. 
But I mean, and it, but it, you know, I, I get where you're coming from. I mean, as a baseball guy and, and a guy who, who likes to do things the right way, um, I really feel like what the Astros did, even though other teams were doing it and the Astros happened to get Correct. caught for it. I mean, it's, it's not any dissimilar to, you know, Dave Ortiz never testing positive for steroids technically. Um, you know, like it's, there's a lot of, of wherewithal in baseball yeah. and some people find some stuff acceptable and others don't. And I've never found the the Houston thing acceptable. Um, and, and I don't know if it's just, you know, I don't know because I, I never had any disdain for the Astros until that happened. In fact, <laughs> I, I kind of liked Altuve and I kind of liked a few of those guys. And I love the original killer bees. Just saying. Berkman and Biggio were the sh- Berkman, Biggio, and B- uh, Bagwell were the shit. That was fun to watch. Yeah, and that team should have won a World Series. They they were that close, and they were one of the best teams at baseball. Terrible uniforms. Yeah. I do agree with it, but I am a little nostalgic about it. At the same time, it's like you know what? Right now, over these weird orange things, maybe that wouldn't be the worst. <laughs> it's like how the angry know, bird, Mar- bird Blue Jay thing is all of a sudden not hated to me all of a sudden because it's it's like high yes, school years yeah, you know those that, well, everything was fun no it really sucked while you were in high school you just don't want to admit it <laughs> <laughs> so just saying but to that point i think the flip side of the coin is that you do have a great world series matchup here mm-hmm. good young players on both teams with sprinklings of good enough veterans and you basically do have the Bryce Harper versus Altuve kind of like as far as your seniority level. Then you have the Hoskins and or Alvarez and Ray Lamutos and whatnot. This is a very, very, very stacked team on both sides. And I, I know the odds are tipping technically in the way of the Houston Astros right now, but I would not sleep on this Philadelphia Phillies team at all. I do think this is a six game series all day. Ken, you want to add? Yeah, oh, they, they've, Jason. The Phillies have been so so interesting. Yeah, give her Kenny. It's just uh, the, the it's been so interesting these playoffs. No, they have. Like I was just you know, rewatching the highlights, and it's like, wow, they're hitting the ball really, really well. Um, my my thing is like I do cheer for the underdogs because, like you said, all the signs say, oh, it should be Houston that should be winning theoretically. But like you said, I'm all about the underdog in this case as well. And if they can still keep it in the ball, because at this point, because I think during the last half of the season or so, I think the last few games that these two teams played each other, I think Houston was like two and one, and one of those games was 10 nothing against the Phillies. So will their pitching be able to nullify Harper and all those other guys who are smashing the ball right now? Was that, yeah, that's going to be the question. Was that before the trade deadline? I can't remember. I feel like it might have been. The 10 nothing game? Yeah. No, I think it was like near the end of the season. I can't remember. Maybe it was. Yeah. I had to go look it up. I don't remember. If my internet was working, I could probably look on it from here. I can't. (laughs) (laughs) Damn tech shit. (laughs) Get the antennas out. Get an antenna out. (laughs) Yeah. I was trying to look up what the odds were, and it's actually pretty even. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a pick them for the most part. For game one, they got Aaron Nola versus Verlander, and they got it's uh, plus 140 on DraftKings versus minus 165. So, you know, they're within points of each other, and they're barely over that threshold yep. of, you know, if anybody that hasn't played on anything like that, that plus 100 is if you bet $100, you make $100. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of how that whole thing works. So, yeah, I, I miss sure. the days where it was just, you know, one to two, which is what that actually is. <laughs> so <laughs> good ratios were easy what the hell's with this plus 100 thing i think they just wanted to hype everything up to the point where they excite you oh i can make a hundred dollars yeah okay great i, yeah, I bet a yeah. dollar at a time i gotta make it look fancy <laughs> yeah yeah for sure so i'll put a buck on the phillies for friday night why not <laughs> why not <laughs> that, why that'll not? turn out to be three dollars at the end <laughs> yeah it's all good but to that point, I do think that this is going to be a very competitive series that it is going to go butt to butt. I don't think it is going to be a, uh, a blowout. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a, a seven game series, but I am guessing six games. And I like I, we were talking, I give you 50 50 on who actually wins it. I'm rooting for the Phillies, but I do think that the, the Astros will squeak by in six games. I think they're finally going to lose a game here in the game one against Nola. And then they're going to have to scrap and claw to win the World Series. Ken, what do you think? 
Yeah, like I think, like I said, all signs point to, to the Astros at this point. Like I said, I'm still kind of cheering for the underdogs. I mean, I was surprised. Remember from a couple episodes ago, who was who do I? Th- who was that? Uh, Alvarez, I believe, was he was hitting the ball really, really well. Yeah. But ever since that series, it seems like his bat has gone quiet. After that, like during the first games against the Mariners, I was like, oh wow, wow, he's hitting the ball really well. He's going to be my MVP pick for whatever if he can keep it up. And looking at him now, I'm like, yep. Not so much anymore. As far as baseball goes, though, he's probably got some of the best bat to ball skills in all of baseball. Yeah. And it's just, it, he's been missing them. And that's what happens this time of year. You run into the best pitching you're going to face all season. And that's what I think he's having to do with. But that's what people forget is that when you, when the team over, when whoever is in the World Series, they would have had to beat at least a couple of the other top teams in their league just to get into this, right? So, you know, you can't assume, oh, it's going to be a blowout. Well, not necessarily. No. And that just shows how much harder this is because right before the other game the other night on Fox Sports uh, here in uh, the States, I don't know if they had it on for you guys up there, they were showing the uh, condensed game of Roy Holiday's no-hitter from the playoffs that uh, back a few years ago. And it just shows you how hard that is to do. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, yeah. um, there's only been two people in baseball history that have done it. Whitey Ford, Roy Halladay, throwing a no-hitter or a perfect game in the in the playoffs, period. You are facing best of the best at that time of the year. And I thought this was one of the crazy things watching that video over because I just happened to be flipping through the channels on Saturday when it came on. And it was like the third inning, and former Blue Jay Scott Rowland is at the dish for the Reds. And this is before he got traded to the Blue Jays. So this is like, you know, amazing. Oh, no, that was after. That's where we traded him to. (laughs) So (laughs) he's basically become like a perennial 300 hitter at that point. He's not hitting a lot of power, but he's spraying the ball over the place. So he was doing really good for the Reds that year. He gets called out on a strike that's probably about this far off the plate. He turns around to the umpire and he goes, if you let him do that the rest of this game, he's going to throw a no hitter. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and that happens i mean I, I, i've i've seen it like i mean you know i've seen it in uh you know when my when my sons went to the provincials for little league um the two teams that ended up going to the finals and you know we ended up winning mm-hmm. but they were painting the outside corners and no one could touch it and you get to a point where the umps are giving you something you have to keep taking yes. it and you know, good hitters will take advantage of it. They'll say, okay, you know, if, if all I'm, you're going to give me is outside junk, then I'm going after at least one of them and I'm going to make you pay for what. But, you know, you, you cannot, and it, it, the best pitchers, everybody, anybody who pitched and had success figured out that early in a game and, and wrote it a whole way through. So, but back to where we're going. Yeah. I did Go want to, uh, I did want to mention that I don't know if you guys saw this or not as a as a bit of an aside as we were mentioning the gambling, but have you guys seen this thing about this uh, mattress mat? No, I must have missed that one. No. The guy who's got so so this guy is a, uh, um, a Houston institution. He started a mattress store right or mattress thing store right across the street from the Astrodome um, sixty years ago or something insane <laughs> like that. He's such an institution. He's given so much money back to the community. He's a huge uh, Astros guy. Um, they actually took him to the warehouse, uh, to the White House, uh, the last time they won the World <laughs> Series, because so he has bet ten million dollars of money that he's raised and and all this other thing on. The, he stands right now to win seventy five million dollars. This is a compound bet that's compounded up into wow. this, and if the Astros win, he wins seventy five million dollars, and. I was reading it earlier. He's not out all that much money when it comes down to it. Like it's, you know, he's put out money into this, but this is sort of a continued bet that he's been doing for a number of years, continuing to bet on the Astros, rolling and rolling and rolling. If they win, it doesn't matter how many games, this guy wins $75 million and he's already committed to giving most of it to charity in Houston. That's really cool. great. I mean, it's such a cool story. If you guys get a chance, there's is, there's actually a story on it right now on uh, ESPN and I believe on uh, Sportsnet as well. Just about this whole tale about this guy going from, you know, broke 50 years ago to starting this mattress um, empire to, 
the, the story leading up to this. And it's, I find it to be phenomenally interesting. It's like the guy uh, at the Raptors games that was, uh, that they took with them on the road and all the rest of that uh, Raptor fan yeah. or whatever they called them. Um, stories like that, or the, you know, the guy who wears the orange jerseys behind, you know, he goes to oh, all the, them. decided that he was just going to spend all his money. Is that the Marlins um, guy? And go to, <laughs> yeah, the Marlins guy, go to as many baseball games as possible. Um, yeah, it's just, if you get a chance to have a read, it's a very interesting story about a cool thing, not to endorse gambling, but <laughs> I mean, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it like yeah, that. I right? was already endorsing it for a dollar buy-in on Friday. So <laughs> he's running with 75 million a house. Yeah, I say, I say he's got a little on me on that whole thing. But to that point, um, I, I got to mention this because you brought up that he's, he owns a mattress store and I, there's a comedian I forget who it was. And this is one of his jokes is today is to, you know, who goes to mattresses stores anymore. You can just, you know, get them delivered right to your house in a big tube that you unroll and yeah. They, oh yeah was, and whatnot I've you know the, right get a casper or whatever the hell it is and go from there and he goes the comedian's joke was yeah it's it's literally went back to that whole idea that you're going through the mattresses because those are actually where the mafia fronts are because nobody goes to my mattress stores <laughs> i was gonna say that on rug stores because i always feel bad for the rug i feel like i'm obligated to just at least walk in just to look in well just to feel it's like which it's there. which country the mafia is from right somebody's got the Mattress store. Somebody's got the rug store. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so anyway, I do have one other question for you guys. And this is a, I was talking with uh, Craig Ballard on Twitter right after Schneider had gotten uh, hired last week. And he was a little upset that the Blue Jays didn't do their due diligence. And to that point, I could see why some Blue Jays fans in general might be a little upset about maybe, okay, we like Schneider, but you do see who's available in the managing market right now. And there is a perennial list of Hall of Famers, which I would say take with a grain of salt at this point in some of their careers, which is why I was on board with the Snyder idea. It's like John Madden, Ron Washington. Um, it's it's those level of guys and not John Madden. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah. Um, but do you, are you upset that the Blue Jays maybe didn't kick the tires on getting one of those veteran presence as a managers before just running with Schneider? I think at the end of the day, Atkins and Shapiro knew the guy they wanted, and it was Schneider all along. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, now that you've said it, I went and had a look myself, and my goodness, there really is a crazy list. Like I said, it's perennial <laughs> managing managers. Hall of Famers from the last, like, 10, 15 years. But, but have they peaked? I mean, I think that, <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the things that we're seeing right now is I think we are seeing the trend to go slightly younger and with, um, you know, with a definite push for the people who have been with your, um, with the, the team for a while now. Um, uh, you're, we're seeing it in other organizations where they're, they're trying to, to sort of feed within. And that's why I think we see a list, you know, top by Tony La Russa or, you know, guys like that who are, are definitely out there. And I mean, you know, one of the best managers of all time. Um, I'm not hiring Tony La Russa for anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know because he's 487 years old. but And he gets I some mean, DUIs and gets away with it. And his, apparently his teammates yeah, have no respect for I mean, Bruce Bochy. <laughs> Bruce Bochy is available, available. John Farrell, um, uh, Buck Showalter, Ron Washington. Buck Showalter is not my favorite either. Mm. Um you know, there is a lot of, of unbelievably talented dudes out there. Um, but I feel like, and I'm going to stick by what I said earlier, I feel like what the Jays need right now is that internal push um, of someone who knows these guys inside and out. He's not making any guesses on what he's getting from any of these guys that he's been with for the last couple of years. And, um, you know, I feel like he's a good blend between a, a dude's dude and a, and a manager uh, good enough to get us, get the Jays through the next couple of years and possibly get a world series or at least get to the world series yeah. out of it. Ken. Yeah, no, I, I feel the same way. Like I, wh why rock the boat at this point? Because bring in any of those, as, as you said, could be hall of famers. Could they change the chemistry that the Jays kind of was de been developing over the last couple of years, right? So uh, the argument would be: is that qu that change good or bad? Another thing, yes. <laughs> is it going to be good or bad? Right? Is it is the person we bring in now going to be like, oh, let's see, we'll we'll give it a couple of years, or are we just going to say, 
Mike Schneider's approach is, okay, I've led the team this far. Now I got the whole season to really, really massage it and really find the right pieces and put everyone in their best opportunities to develop or to produce for this team. And I think then, yeah, I think we should have stuck with the, we stick with Schneider. Um, hopefully they, they perform, the Jays can perform in the season that we don't uh, get rid of uh, him like we did uh, Montoya for a bit. So it's like, okay, you got the runway. Show us that you're you're worth these three years because I think we all have faith in you right now. Yeah. So my uh, my reply to the Twitterverse during this conversation with Blue Jays Twitter last week was, I have Blue Jay history to quote and drop on you, and then we're going to wrap the show here. <laughs> <laughs> so there's only been so many managers in Blue Jays history that have actually been fired in the middle of the season. Every one of those managers that seceded those managers has went on to a what I would say successful tenure with their their team. Um, And they were never just a stand in for the end of the season. They were always a carryover to the following season. And I think actually when I was looking through the stat the other day, that there was no interim manager that didn't get at least two years of managing full time. Mm -hmm. So take that with, as you will, the most notable. Yeah is Jimmy Williams after getting the Blue Jays this close in 1988 again. (sighs) Loses his job after a horrendous start in 1989. That was the most winningest manager in Toronto Blue Jays history in Cito Gaston that came in after him. And it was an eerily similar situation. The team is not doing what we expect it to be. But how do we push it over the hurdle? This was earlier in the season, which was where I think that many Blue Jays fans started arguing after how April (laughs) went this season and why maybe this took so long. And maybe that would have been the difference in the, um, you know, even in the late term here in the what was a very brief Blue Jays playoff appearance. The uh, Cito Gaston took over after about um, 30 games and went on to a mere 77 and 49 record to finish the season for the Blue Jays in 1989. And once again, just missed the playoffs. But then after that, in 1990 and 1989 and 1990, they or 1990 and 1991, they were building up the team that we currently know as the back-to-back World Series champions. Schneider's got a Great little members. bit of a head start on those teams in 89 and 90, as far as talent is concerned. So you Mm -hmm. can make the argument that where the team currently stands versus that argument is basically 1991 is how I figured it. Yeah, I I don't disagree. I think it's an an incredible point. And um, I feel like I feel like the team moved into a different a different zone when Schneider took over full time. Um, I felt it was possibly a little too comfortable. And I think they've now figured that part of it out. And they realize they've got to bring their lunch pails every day next year. And, and I, that's my hope. And my hope is that he, he seems to be a pretty, you know, a pretty understanding, but a tough dude. And everything that I'm reading online from the players and stuff like that is that that's exactly what he is. He's hard on them. He expects a lot, but you know, and I feel like that down the road will really play out well for the Jays. I'm just hoping they give him his run. I'm yeah. hoping that they don't, there isn't a stumble next year and they don't, you know, they, they, they don't pull the trigger on it. I know the yeah. Jays aren't known for doing that, but um, baseball is getting to be a bit of a fickle duck. And if they get that catalyst that we were talking about, Jason, I think that that's going to go away pretty quickly about the quote unquote, you know, laying an egg to begin the season or anything like that. It's, they're, yeah. they're going in with their, yeah. their teeth ready right now. I think this off season and then those guys are even more hungry than they were either the year before. <laughs> I sure hope so. Yeah, I hope I hope so too. Like, oh, I'm just excited for next season and see how they're going to perform. Like you said, I hope they don't, like you said, pull the trigger too quickly. So if we, if uh, if Schneider loses a few games here and there, like a couple losing streaks, we just hope it's not too big where they're going to be like, oh, we're going to bow to the pressure and yeah, sorry, we're going to look for someone else. Let's not change that. Give him some time to do it because he performed well to so from the second half of the season to get us to the playoffs. And cause I don't think when he took over, I, I, were we even that considered to be making the playoffs at that point? Cause we weren't, uh, it was almost like we were kind of like 500 or something like that. Yeah. Right? They were 46 and 42 think, when they, I'm looking at it right now as I had the manager yeah, yeah. stuff in front of me, Montoya was 46 and 42 Shire, as you mentioned earlier, when 46 and 28 to finish the season. It's awesome. So 
That's why he earned a job. And I, the reason I think they're going to give him all the chain that they need, three year deal. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So he's going to make money. And even to talk a one year extension. You know, the, to talk, they, they don't usually, when they're talking about a manager, put enough faith in him to put a, even put a one year extension in the discussion. Right. Like, he's got the two year buffer already. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, so, yeah. Just get us further than our last, than the wild card. Get us to the first round next year. And if we still, okay, good. Get, make us, get us in the playoffs again and get past the first two rounds. And then we'll, you know, as long as we're seeing, as long as they're seeing progress, they'll keep them. <laughs> right. yeah. Technically made progress last year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. it. <laughs> so, anyways, anybody have anything they'd like to add before I let Ken run his wonderful new outro? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I'm excited about the playoffs starting on the weekend. I know we'll have a lot to talk about next week, um, which will be a Mid World Series you know, show. <laughs> so yes, it will. Really- It'll be a good time. And Halloween. Yeah, trick or treat. Halloween. Some, uh, Blue Jays candy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Meeting free agents and <laughs> trade trade rumors. I should take some uh I should take some pictures. Our our street where I live is particularly we've got like five of the like houses to go see on Halloween. So maybe I'll take some pictures and fire yeah. them out onto the interwebs. There you go. I show you some of the people put a lot of work into the displays around here and uh, it gets pretty fun around the old Halloween. Yeah. Right down the street from me because I live five five seconds from Buffalo, New York, here in Rochester, New York. <laughs> it's uh look it looks like a um yeah it, Bruce Smith did it a few years ago, which is one of the best all time sack leaders in the NFL ever, and he had all these tombstones of all the quarterbacks he sacked <laughs> in his front yard, and he goes, "Hey, would you like to come with me for a tour?" <laughs> I I That's took him awesome. down. I murdered him. I took him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bruce Smith is a treasure, but to that point, it's very fun and we get to do that. So, um, but yes, uh, but on that note, Blue Jays fans, thank you for tuning in. I am sorry to say once again, the live feed on our wonderful new tech fund here is not working again, but I will have the video posted up really soon. <laughs> so you can all watch us on your uh, Thursday morning commute. If you can't watch us, make sure you listen to the, the podcast episode on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcasting pleasures from. And once again, until next week, fellas, two claps, Ric Flair. <laughs> One, two, three, two. <laughs> Let's go, Blue Jays. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Jaybird Watching Podcast. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch at BirdwatchingGC and our YouTube channel. If you want to support the show and get extra content, please consider joining it to our Patreon at patreon.com slash birdwatchinggc. Go Jays go.